liquid skin of planet Earth live creatures of unearthly beauty. These tiny animals have crossed oceans of space and time in an epic bid for survival. Wanderers through inner space, they carry the future of their species. On their odyssey, they have faced extinction and awesome planetary force. Theirs is an evolutionary success story made possible by a remarkable reproductive strategy. Reefs are exotic interruptions in otherwise barren tropical seas. They're oases of life, vibrant, colorful, and competitive. But this vast canvas of living art has not just materialized out of the blue. Coral and its cohorts have arrived from somewhere. Though they seem solid and unmoving, reefs have spread themselves throughout the tropical oceans. How have they overcome their immobility? The answer has its origin in one of life's most fundamental acts, sex. But the reproductive rights of coral communities are shrouded in mystery. It's only in the last 10 years that the reef has begun to reveal its private life. For animals, sex is a fact of life. But for the rocks of the reef, a sex life would seem out of the question. But corals are not rocks. They're colonies of tiny animals. Only the outer surface of these colonies is alive, a living skin populated by polyps. Their structure is simple, a tube with a mouth surrounded by stinging tentacles. These tiny animals, a few millimeters across, build reefs. The beauty of the individual rivals that of the colony as a whole. A single pioneering polyp clones or buds itself endlessly to produce a colony of hundreds, even thousands of identical individuals. In theory, a polyp could live forever this way, unchanging and unmoving. But change and mobility are essential to all species. On the reef, sex achieves both in one elegantly simple solution. It's a brief extravaganza, cued by the summer moon. For the rest of the year, the priority is coping with life's demands. Inside the reef's barrier, garden eels vie for tasty morsels. They inspect drifting particles. Some are food some just broken parts of other reef creatures. But in the quiet lagoon, every particle is inspected by somebody. A goatfish snuffles industriously. Within a self-made sandstorm, it feasts on small worms and mollusks which it locates using sensitive barbels. But the real heavy movers in the sand business 
are sea cucumbers. The basic design is a long hollow tube that creeps around the lagoon floor. They push sand in one end and out the other. Some sea cucumbers mop the reef with sticky feet, passing edible particles into their mouths. Nature constantly tests and refines its designs. The basic theme remains, only the detail varies. With its body completely buried in sand, another sea cucumber unfurls its feathery arms to net drifting debris. Every particle of sand in the lagoon was once part of the animals and plants that make up the reef. Sand production is aided by heavy-jawed grazers like the bumphead parrotfish. Moving in herds like buffalo over the reef, they bite off pieces of coral, crush it to powder and leave clouds of new sand in their wake. The reef supports an endless variety of grazers, scrapers, and biters. Many seem to bite a dead reef, but are actually cropping back a fuzz of algae that grows by day. The wastes of these schools of fishes act as fertilizer to the plants they crop. The waters surrounding the reef are poor in nutrients, so recycling of its limited resources is essential. It begins with the invisible haze of life called plankton. It continually showers the reef. Just as plankton gather nutrients from the ocean, fish like the spiny chromis gather plankton, so nutrients from the ocean are imported into the reef's economy. Poised like ghostly daggers, barracuda cruise the coral fringe. They are after more than planktonic prey. These larger predators are drawn to the rich life of the reef. impoverished oceans, the reef is a prosperous economy. Built up from nothing by the labors of tiny animals and plants, it attracts investment from thousands of other species. It becomes a bank, or a storehouse of the ocean's resources. But some creatures are a storehouse in themselves. A sleek manta ray wings its way through the late afternoon. It owes its huge bulk and wingspan of five meters to the millions of minute plankton it sieves from tropical waters. Mantas are free agents, opportunists. They exploit the reef as and when it focuses their food supply. They feed and then move on, leaving each reef a little poorer for their passing. The blubber jelly voyages at the whim of wind and tide, feeding on plankton as it drifts. Billowing in the currents, it's an occasional visitor to the reef.
Like all jellyfish, it's a free living relative of the unmoving corals on the reef below. Building on the skeletons of others, hard corals extract calcium from seawater. Tiny polyps toil in limestone to craft their biological works of art. From the hard coral foundation has arisen a rambling architecture. This ever-expanding labyrinth has another dimension. It creates living space for related corals. like Gorgonians strain against the current. On the reef slope, soft corals sweep the same current. Their flexible arms house polyps, but unlike hard corals, these are no reef builders. Lacking a solid skeleton, they draw support from tiny limestone spines within their tissues. When the soft coral dies, it disappears, leaving no lasting monument. Reef plants appear to be just as ephemeral, but their role is fundamental. All capture energy from sunlight. Some also contribute to the reef structure. The brittle green halomeda is mainly limestone. It constantly sheds gritty flakes into the lagoon. The stony skin of pink coralline algae glues the limestone blocks of the reef together. Filamentous algae seems little more than a green fur on rocks, but it's the pasture of the reef and essential to all the reef's grazers. But the ties that bind algae and the reef together go deeper. Like algae, hard corals also require sunlight to grow. This is a clue to an intimate relationship that literally fuels the reef. Corals are twin-engined. They're animals that have harnessed the power of plants to build the vast and elaborate limestone structures we call the reef. How have they done it? Somewhere in their evolutionary past, corals struck a deal with microscopic single-celled algae called zooxanthellae. The algae sheltered inside the polyp tissue, producing sugars from sunlight and recycling coral waste products. This partnership became a most powerful evolutionary achievement. Between them, they built reefs. It's not until the sun sets that Coral's second animal engine is revealed. As darkness falls, plankton begins its nightly ascent into the waters surrounding the reef. From their stony lairs emerge the polyps. Wreathed with stinging tentacles, each pollen is poised to reap a grisly harvest. Other members of the night shift emerge to feed. Feather stars take up strategic positions in the current. 
They sieve plankton and particles with their arms. Slender prey, a formation of razorfish, expertly mimic the harp coral that hides their knife-like bodies. A chaotic ball of eel-tailed catfish swarms in mid-water between feeding. Lagoon sands below them are loaded with hidden delicacies. These miniature catfish scout for their supper in rank and file aided by sensitive chin whiskers. Lagoon sediments provide dainty pickings for the feather-mouthed sea cucumber. Little more than an elastic tube filled with water, it delicately wipes each feathered finger across its mouth, collecting food along with sand. Most sea cucumbers have rubbery bodies that make them unpalatable to predators. They continue their slow work of shunting sediment day and night and have no need to hide. Unlike the sophisticates of the night shift, a hunter by night, an octopus is able to change both color and texture. Hiding and bluffing. This stealthy camouflage expert is both actor and magician. Its relative, the cuttlefish, shares the octopus talent for lightning color change. Shunning camouflage altogether, the flamboyant Spanish dancer flounces through the night. Its colorful costume is a signal to predators. Like other nudibranchs or sea slugs, the Spanish dancer looks much better than it tastes. Overcome by darkness, parrotfish retire into the fabric of the reef. Some of these daytime dandies sleep in a gossamer cocoon of their own weaving. Perhaps this mucus bubble disguises their scent to unwelcome visitors. A fast-moving vegetarian, the parrotfish grazes algae with its bird-like beak. Clownfish may be left out in the dark when their protective anemone shuts up for the night. This is the reef's best-known example of shared lives. The reef is a multi-layered organization, and its inhabitants have perfected the art of living on and in each other. Liaisons are everywhere, but some may be hard to find. An ornamented anemone harbors color-coordinated shrimp Competition for the reef's limited resources is tough. When citizens live together, there are winners and losers. The blood-sucking fish louse has a one-way relationship with its suffering host. Even corals are not exempt from exploitation by others. Down among the valleys of the polyps lies another world, a world that's never been seen. Among the heaving tissues of the polyp live flatworms the size of a pinhead. Living on the thin veneer of the coral's mucus, 
these tiny lodges appear to do no harm, gliding like magic carpets in a world of altered reality. On the reef, every opportunity has been investigated. Space is at a premium, and overcrowding a fact of life. Invariably, property disputes develop, and borders are drawn. Where two different species meet, encounters can be nasty. Nightly space wars, fought by special stinging tentacles, leave a conspicuous white scar of conflict. Surrounded, this fatal siege may last months. A plate coral spreads outward to meet itself. Here, the problem is resolved by a small fence of self-recognition. Over time, this living carpet evolves. Territorial struggles shape the reef as a multitude of species vie for position. Shading its competitors from light, the fast-growing plate corals borrow a strategy from the forest canopy. Other inhabitants can neither outgrow nor outsting their competitors. For sponges, chemical warfare is the way. Their tissues are loaded with toxins, a kind of natural anti-fouling that preserves their space. Just as space invaders are part of life, so too are space makers. Sometimes an opening comes by chance. Storms and ocean swells damage the reef, tearing long-lived corals from their foundations. But not all space is created by the elements. The crown of thorn starfish, a coral predator, opens up new territory with each meal. And new settlers are in ready supply. Out of the blue curtain of distance, the currents propel a sea full of eager immigrants, a multitude of microscopic larvae. This humble bean, covered with beating hairs, is the beginning of a new coral. Equally disguised, a larval sea urchin is a long way from its final form. Even the giant clam begins life microscopically. All reef larvae are designed to voyage in the plankton. To become citizens of a reef, they will need to take on their adult form. But first, they must find a safe place to settle. Journeying day and night, they may stumble upon a reef, a sentinel in the dark sea. But their sanctuary is, in fact, a snare. Night has unmasked the reef. Poised and armed, it has become a waiting wall of mouths. The graceful Gorgonian is now a web of death, its animal nature revealed. Thousands of tiny polyps wait outstretched. A feather star sways in the gathering storm. A million mouths wait in silence for the microscopic voyagers to blunder their way into outstretched arms. The weaponry of the reef is revealed. 
a sinister array of traps, sieves, harpoons, and clutching tentacles. The methods may vary, but the final sentence will always be the same. And night after night, this random microscopic rain falls. Millions of epic voyages end in tiny but titanic struggles. Despite huge losses, some larvae survive their perilous voyage and settle. They grow to become solid citizens of the reef, joining the wall of mouths and waging space wars with each other. This endless lottery of settlement and survival weaves a visual tapestry of species, color, pattern and form. But beauty and harmony is a mask. It hides chaos and competition. Reef society is shaped in a war zone of relentless conflict. The reef thrives in adversity prospering despite its internal struggles. But reefs have also endured struggles of planetary dimension over enormous geological time. Through the millennia, continents drift, climates change, sea levels rise and fall. As the world moves around them, coral reefs remain, as always, immobile. They seem at the mercy of geology, yet today's reefs have somehow survived 240 million years of global upheaval. Coral reefs rim continental shelves and cap volcanic seamounts throughout tropical oceans. But once, reefs lived in an ancient sea called the Tethys. It lay between two supercontinents, which split apart, causing Africa and India to drift northwards. The broad Tethys Sea, evolutionary home of modern reef animals, was squeezed out of existence. Over millions of years, it became a war zone of continental collision, earthquakes, and sea level change. And the animals evolving here came under siege. Amidst these shunting continents, reef life had two choices, extinction or escape. Today's reefs are built by immobile creatures that somehow dispersed and evolved from their ancestral communities in the Tethys. But to escape the ravages of geology, they had to play an evolutionary ace. This ace not only allowed them to move, but to change. It was sex. And every summer, the age-old ritual unfolds. Shoals of tiny fry appear with their parents, the spiny chromis. Their behavior is unusual among reef fish. They guard their growing offspring. A female cuttlefish holds an egg daintily in her tentacles. She chooses a nest with great care and places the fertile egg securely within.
But despite her plump maternalism, this is the extent of her parenting. From the time the egg is placed in its coral cradle, the young cuttlefish will be on its own. This careful handling of individual eggs requires more time and effort than most other reef dwellers invest. The giant clam makes no attempt to nurture its young. However, it does invest enormous energy, producing and broadcasting many millions of eggs and sperm. With each mighty contraction, the waters of the lagoon turn milky. Fish dart closer, feasting on the seasonal delicacy. Other, perhaps more prudent species, will wait for dusk before they begin to spawn. The male coral trout emerges in sober courting colors. With his tail flagged black, he patrols his territory. Females are lying low on the reef, their swollen bellies heavy with eggs. Concealed in the watery twilight, they await the male's advances. His elaborate dance is designed to tempt a female from her retreat. Reluctantly, she leaves the reef's protection encouraged by the ardent male. The climax of their courting ritual is a spawning rush, a split second when eggs and sperm are released near the surface. Leaving the future to chance once again. As summer waters warm, other biological clocks are ticking. The reef below begins to stir. Cued by the full moon in November, countless coral polyps bulge. They are ripe with packets of egg and sperm that have taken months to prepare. Their time has come. Others respond to an unseen urge. Crown of thorn starfish begin their slow creep to high points on the reef. Even inert creatures are stirring. Sea cucumbers scurry at their own pace, away from the lagoon floor to the coral ledges above. Here, they begin a sinuous dance, swaying to an ancient evolutionary rhythm. Feathermouth rises to the occasion. This is an event too compelling to miss. From within the bulging polyp comes an answering movement, building to a slow spiral as each puts the finishing touches to its precious bundle of eggs and sperm. This living jewel is the coral's passport to mobility.
While polyps turn in time, the hypnotic dance of the sea cucumbers has reached its silent climax. Males begin exuding sperm from tiny pores on their heads. They rear and sway to scatter their sperm throughout the lagoon, perhaps to meet the eggs released by females. The crown of thorns smoulders dramatically, releasing a misty cloud of sperm. It drapes itself across coral that would normally be its food. Now begins one of the most monumental and secret events in nature, mass spawning on the Great Barrier Reef. In unison, polyps pucker and propel their fragile spheres into space. Locked in limestone, they cannot move to mate. Instead, they reach out to each other with tiny voyaging probes. Their cue is exact. Each year, each species will spawn at the same time on the same day. We are privileged to be spectators as the reef stages this unearthly performance. Each night, for a week, following the full moon, the intensity builds. New species adding to the growing curtain of new life. Along 1,200 kilometers of the northeast coast of Australia, countless millions of polyps spawn in unison. Some corals are hermaphrodites, while others have separate colonies of females and males. Whatever their sex, each has its own pace and style.
The synchronized spawning creates a web of drifting food for those with an appetite for it. A hermit crab picks off eggs as they emerge. But predators take only a fraction of the coral's output. Most passes unhindered into the sea. And still, the outpouring continues. For these few nights of the year, space wars seem insignificant. Adversaries are united by powerful ancient forces. The reef acts like a single organism, intent on securing its future. Living rocks erupt in a frenzy of color and movement. But the climax is yet to come. Six nights after the full moon, silent and unheralded, there is a kaleidoscopic finale. The giant plate corals, each with hundreds of thousands of polyps, explode into ascending galaxies of pink and white. The sea is now a soup of colored eggs against the black depths. But the performance is not yet over. Incredibly, there is one final encore. The lagoon becomes laced with streamers, the reproductive segments of polychaete worms, seeming to bid bon voyage to the millions of new lives who set sail tonight. As the frenzy of release subsides, the tide plays its part in the completion of the night's magic. The moon stills the restless sea as egg and sperm bundles rise to the surface. Somehow in this vast and chaotic scramble, the right egg and right sperm will meet, fertilize and develop. Each morning, the sea bears witness to the night's toil as the future hopes of the reef community drift away. Here is the solution to the reef's immobility. From this floating slick, the tiny developing larvae begin their odyssey. Opportunists take advantage of the annual bounty, but against the overwhelming abundance, they make little impression. However, in the vast ocean, this ribbon of new life will remain vulnerable. As plankton blooms around the spawning raft, more opportunists gather. Larvae may end their journey on the stinging tentacles of a jellyfish, or engulfed by the ballooning jaws of marauding manta rays.
Up here, invisible, could be the beginning of a new coral. Out of the countless millions dispersed, only a few will survive their journey. Far fewer will evade the wall of mouths and find a safe place to settle. But despite incredible odds, the survival of just one coral lava is enough. They cross the trackless oceans, minute in size, monumental in importance. Time will see their strategy prevail. Even the perilous flanks of an active volcano may be journey's end. Having crossed ocean wastes as an invisible mist in the plankton, coral larvae settle to found a reef. Its volcanic support will subside, but once established, a reef outpost will build and maintain itself, gathering the rare larval voyages over time. Each new atoll is a stepping stone to the next. In this way, corals have marched through time and great ocean distance. They have established collections of living art in the galleries of empty oceans. Reefs are portrayed as fragile ecosystems with a delicate beauty. And yet, they're robust enough to have survived millions of years of fierce competition and planetary upheaval. They're exquisite but they're also dynamic and adaptive communities. They've adopted mass spawning and dispersal as their incredible solution to the problems of time, change, and immobility. The architects of the mighty atolls and the Great Barrier Reef are simple animals and plants. The limestone fortresses they build are monuments to the evolutionary success of sex on the reef. <laughs> 